Hello, my name is Ryan Goldsworthy. Today, I will be sitting down with Captain Mark Sargent, a former military chaplain and member of the Canadian Airborne Regiment. Mark is a Canadian veteran of the Somalia mission of 1992 and 1993. In my interview with Mark, he speaks to his experiences and his insights on the Somalia mission and its aftermath. Well, I grew up in um, uh, town St. Thomas, Ontario, uh, born at the beginning of the 60s, so at the end of the baby boom. And it was a great place to grow up, but it was, I always thought it was small. And uh, so unless you were gonna kind of marry a cheerleader or work on a farm or work at Ford, who was a big employer at the time, there really wasn't a lot there. There was, but mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to try something different. So I joined the reserves. All right. And that gave me a little bit of pocket money, some training experiences, which I thought were really fantastic. Mm -hmm. When I look back on it, it was like, you got to go to Ipawash for a weekend or Borden, right. maybe Petawawa, which were exciting places if you came from St. Thomas, because mm -hmm. none of my friends had ever been to any of those places and you got mm -hmm. to do cool things. Sure. Um, May I ask what year that was that you enlisted in the reserves? 75, 76. Okay. Yeah, someone's going to do the math and say you lied about your age getting in, and they will be correct. <laughs> Excellent. So, so um, fr from there, um, did not do well in high school, but had a great mentor who was the honorary lieutenant colonel of the regiment, a guy called Bomber Chamberlain, wins the military cross in Italy with the Perth Regiment. Wow. So quite an exceptional guy. Anyway, one night at a function, I was... Uh, one of those wine stewards that reserve guys got to be, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, he said, you know, young sergeant, you could do more with your life. You could do a lot more. And he was either on the admissions committee or knew the admissions committee of RMC. And he says, I could probably get you to RMC. You know, you would do well there. Excellent. Just brush up your marks. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a good young soldier. I don't think it really was, but he saw something. Right. And always in the background, I'd thought about priesthood. It was sort of there. My family was Catholic, not overly Catholic, but that's where we were. So I stayed one year, two years, stayed all through seminary and was happily ordained a priest. And um, I think my military background gave me a, a good sense of what rules are and how they should be followed or how to understand structures. So it was good. Mm -hmm. um, was ordained in 87 and then served in civilian parishes, as I did most summers. Uh, while I was in the seminary, uh, you serve in civilian parishes. And for two summers, I served in military parishes. So that was kind of cool. The, my local bishop gave me permission to re-enter the regular army in 1990, 1991. And that's right. I, uh, the two worlds kind of crossed. I stayed in the regular forces until I was medically released in 99. Um, and then my military, military career kind of ended. Um, when I was appointed the honorary lieutenant colonel of the very regiment that I had joined all those years before right. and got to serve for five years as the honorary lieutenant colonel, Excellent. which I finished a couple of years ago. And um, that's that's kind of it. So I went from one of my favorite pictures I have is me as a, a no hook private. I think I have about a 22 inch waist and I'm about eight feet tall, right. it looks like. And uh, standing there with my submachine gun and the newly appointed honorary lieutenant colonel at that time was walking past looking mm -hmm. at me and i thought wow i, I am now that guy You're that guy i am that guy you can put them side by side you know yeah with you passing by another uh young recruit of the time looking in amazement yeah. like who is this old fogey exactly <laughs> yeah <laughs> anyway so that that gives a, a a bit of a thumbnail i hope excellent no that's perfect as we know, events in the world, the government in Somalia collapsed in 91. And that brought the opportunity um, for the UN to intervene. So in 1992, as you obviously know, Canada sent about 1,400 men to Somalia. So my question for you, Mark, so heading into that Somalia mission in 92, from your perspective, 
what was it about and what was Canada's role as you understood it? As I understood it at the time, it would be different than how I understand it now, having read some pretty scholarly papers mm -hmm. on what happened. Um, two things happened in the Horn of Africa. The government failed again, and the media was there in Mogadishu to see the extreme poverty and the death and just total famine. I think if the media had not been there, uh -huh. this chapter wouldn't need to be written. Uh -huh. And so for the first part of our training in, in Petawawa, it was all blue beret, white vehicles, and the unit, the regiment had been training for a mission in Western Sahara that didn't go, but we were on standby for about eight or nine months. So lots of, lots of tension, lots of anxiety, missions canceled. Then the Somalia mission comes up. It's got UN in it, so it's sure it's a UN sort of thing. Mm -hmm. We trained under a peacekeeping mandate. Right. And, and we had to be mechanized. So the, the challenge was to take an airborne regiment, make it an airborne battle group, mm -hmm. and then make it mechanized. By definition, the airborne isn't mechanized. Right. So we had to take vehicles from 1RCR at the time mm -hmm. and other units and make it mechanized as opposed to sending the other units. Right. Anyway, lots of anxiety, lots of rush, rush, rush. And then at the very last minute, once vehicles had already gone to Montreal to be loaded on ships, the mission changed. And I think we had about um, two weeks to prepare. I remember we were all brought together. So very quickly, overnight, Maroon Berets came back. Anything you went on the vehicles had to be uh -huh. scrubbed. Um, whole different attitude right. as opposed to peacekeeping. Uh -huh. Chapter six, chapter seven, I believe, is peacemaking. Right. Totally. Changed very quickly. Very quickly changing a mindset. It almost seemed, if I may, almost haphazard to be changing it last minute. It like was. That. Well, it, it, would, it would seem that way. Now, you, the, you have a professional army. Canada has a standing army, the professional. People go to RMC, staff mm -hmm. school, staff college. They've been gone through all the hoops. Mm -hmm. So we should know how to do this. Um, I can't really speak adequately in depth on some of the, maybe those systemic problems mm -hmm. with, with the regiment at the time or the Canadian army. Right. But um, certainly it was a challenge to take this group of men and women that had been trained to do one thing and literally within days say, no, no, it's going to be different now. Right. Um, so to create the mindset, to establish the mission format, and the, the, the rules of engagement. Mm -hmm. I didn't see the rules of engagement until just about June when we came home. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And it, and it was 13 pages long. Wow. So jumping off that, if I may, it's a good segue. So how did your preconceptions and your understanding what the mission was about just prior to deployment, right. how did it match with reality once you got there to Bella Twain? It, it really didn't. So lots of talk about humanitarian, the warring clans. So one clan might control a road. Another clan might control a warehouse. Another clan controls the trucks. Mm -hmm. So they all have to get along to move food. The ICRC, International Commission of the Red Cross, was there mm -hmm. and a number of other NGOs. And they at the time had to hire technicals. The technicals were nothing more than than guys that had heavy machine guns mounted in the back of white Toyota pickup trucks nice. and provided violence. Mm -hmm. So NGOs don't do this. The Red Cross doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, they had to apologize some years later for even doing this. So mm -hmm. we, we arrived in the country where the, we would be escorting convoys, creating a, 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 a the conditions for peaceful discussions mm -hmm. and negotiations amongst the clans and the government. Mm -hmm. But it turns out there really was no government. There was no rule of law. Um, so anything we were supposed to do uh, that involved the local government agency, mm -hmm. well, the government agency wasn't there. Interesting. So is it fair to say, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, but from what you're telling me, the conditions that you walked into, you and the other members of the regiment, that no individual who you were serving with expected what they got when they landed there. 
I, I think we expected some hostility amongst the clans, mm -hmm. that, and, and that, that was a traditional way, sure. that, so that, that was there to begin with. I don't think, we're, we don't work for foreign affairs. So to have the in-depth knowledge to know who is who, I mean, our intelligence people work very, very hard on the ground trying to draw an organizational chart of mm -hmm. who's there, but you're always taking information from somebody who speaks English right. and you don't know where their loyalties lie. Right. And then there was lots and lots of weapons. So there was a program to kind of search for weapons or confiscate weapons, or they would bring weapons in. Mm -hmm. And and so we did what soldiers do. We patrolled, made roads safe, helped the ICRC set sure. up feeding centers, did some humanitarian work. Mm -hmm. But the broader picture of where does this fit into reestablishing a country mm -hmm. Or rule of law, I. I don't think that was supposed to be our job. I see. So on that, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here, and just to ask you. How did the locals respond to your humanitarian efforts? Depending on the clan. Sometimes very very well. You know, um, but if we were dealing with a clan that didn't particularly have anything in our area. Mm -hmm they would be quite belligerent. I see. And to our surprise, um, they had heavy weapons. Right. And were not afraid to use them. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, I guess the mindset was, we're here to help you. And it clearly looks like you don't want to be helped. Right. Or we shouldn't help those people, we should help you. Mm -hmm. And and for the average soldier, that's very confusing. How do you sort all of that out? I don't know. And, and that was always a... Mm -hmm was always kind of a a thorn in our side you, you, you would negotiate and it would sound like it was going someplace mm -hmm. and then someone would say well you didn't negotiate with the right people those aren't our recognized leaders you wasted right. your time it, it'd be like in your own hometown yeah. go five blocks from where you live mm -hmm. in your hometown mm -hmm. and and tell me the politics of that street right and then how you could knock on somebody's door and be able to communicate effectively right. about how they should change their life mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't happen. Right. So, I mean, but you say, look, guys, we're, we're here. Mm -hmm. This is our job. Mm -hmm. This is what we do best. You know, the nation's watching us. Right. And these people depend on us. And our, our role, mm -hmm. really, is to make space. Mm -hmm. to, to give them space to have the discussions that they need to have. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't... I think one of the challenges is we didn't know what success looked like. Mm -hmm. And we're all... In, in the military, I think, right. we're all problem solvers. So give me something to do, a set time to do it in, and mm -hmm. at the end of it, I can say, I did that thing. Right. Can you give me a sense of the difficulty of managing the complex, sometimes conflicting role of soldier versus peacekeeper, particularly in such a chaotic and often violent environment? Well, you have to start with, we are peacemakers. Mm -hmm. That's so the mandate changed from peacekeeping to peacemaking. Right. So it doesn't mean you're, you're warlike and you just want to start thumping people mm -hmm. or hurting people. No, but now the rules of engagement have shifted. Sure. Um, and it was funny because it didn't shift in the mind of the, of the average Canadian because mm -hmm. the media would come over and make and say things like, well, I'm surprised you're all carrying weapons. Right. You know, and what are these old weapons over here? This looks like old Russian or German stuff. Right. Well, it is. That's what we confiscated in the last two days. Right. Well, where'd you get that from? Mm -hmm. The Somalis. Mm -hmm. Well, why do they have weapons? Right. So, you know, and, and so we'd take them to a feeding center and there wouldn't be many people. And we'd be way out in the desert, you know, and they well, where's, where's the people? Well, they died. Mm -hmm. well, why'd they die? Starvation. Yeah. Well, what did you guys do? Well, there's nothing we could do. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many things have to happen. It's like the like a tumblers on a lock. Right. All those things have to line up mm -hmm. so you can use the road. Mm -hmm. But you can use force, but then what does that do if you use too much force? Mm -hmm. Or if they won't let you use the trucks, or yes. the petrol didn't arrive, mm -hmm. or the ICRC says we're not going to do that today, mm -hmm. or 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 or. I mean, it was just it, the it expectations was, seem impossible. Well, they were really challenging, and I'll tell you one of the one of the personal challenges was helping myself and the soldiers understand that they just these people think differently than we do. Mm -hmm. 
so an example, we'd be out on a patrol and uh, you might find some wounded Somalis or illnesses that we would not ever have to, like tuberculosis or leprosy, mm -hmm. um, all kinds of things, horribly, horrible diseases. So we put the guys in a stretcher, put them in a truck, take them to the local medical center. Now, a hut with a Red Cross flag and some people that worked as nurses and probably a doctor. Right. We'd bring the, the person in on the stretcher. Mm -hmm. There would be some conversation with the person on the stretcher. I see. Nine out of ten times, we'd watch. They'd just turn the stretcher over mm -hmm. and dump the person off the mm -hmm. stretcher, go in the back and take the uh, uh, water in the solution for uh, uh, antiseptic solution, right. clean the stretcher, yeah. and then give it to somebody else to go get other people get the next person and we say well, what about this guy mm -hmm. he's not our clan wow what you know we just took a whole day to get him here yeah not our clan and then you instantly well what do you do yeah what what do you do a mother coming past the front of our encampment one day um and we had a, a, a our hospital flies the red cross sure and of course for the people, that's a Red Cross station, right? That's a ICRC thing. Mm -hmm. They don't, Geneva Convention means nothing mm -hmm. to them. Anyway, this lady threw what looked like a, a big bundle of rags, mm -hmm. just dirty rags, over the big barbed wire fence, thump lands in the grass. And she just stood there and pointed. And it was right in front of the hospital. The medic came out and then do it. Well, it's a baby. But the baby is so full of tuberculosis, like the source. It's, I've never seen tuberculosis source. Right. We don't see that. No. So the mother is there saying, you got to look after my baby now. Like that's not, but that's, and this Canadian is there. Oh my God, what do we do? What do we do? Right. We're not responsible for yeah. the local, like we don't provide them with medical services. Right. Transferring that responsibility. I mean, that's. Mother throws her own child over a fence. <sighs> Talk about an ethical dilemma. And, and, and the soldiers would just get like, what, what the hell, mm. Padre? What are we doing here with these people? Mm -hmm. You know, and how do you respond? What can you say? Yeah. It's really different. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sorry, but it's it's not us. Yeah. We know we have to be faithful to what we know to be mm -hmm. true sure. and right and do that. Mm -hmm. And when we don't, and there was a couple great examples of us not being faithful to what we're supposed to do. Yeah. It got us into trouble. Right. We did not get into trouble because the Somalis were doing what they do. Mm -hmm. We get into trouble when we didn't do what we were supposed to do. Understood. You have to stay within those parameters. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you mind if I show you a photograph and just ask you for some context? Sure. So this photograph was available online. Uh, I found it in the Canadian Encyclopedia. And it just had a basic subtitle and not much more than that. So because you are the man in the photo, yeah. Could you provide just a little more context and what's going on here? Sure. So this is a photograph taken by a vehicle going past the road. It's a, actually, in this picture, there's five, five young people. Yeah. And they're tied and there's signs around their neck and they're blindfolded. Yeah. And I'm standing behind them. Mm -hmm. uh, May so, I ask, do you remember the moment it was taken? Oh, or, yeah. yeah. The very yep. specific moment? I do. So leading up to this, as, and you'll see there's more equipment coming. Anyway, when we had trouble with the, the kids, because no matter how big the fence was, and, and I'm talking three levels high of razor wire, mm -hmm. three deep. Wow, that's significant. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's reminding me of the Western Front, let alone in exactly. Somalia in the 90s. Mm -hmm. The military police section was reduced to two people. Yeah. Just from, two. From the entire camp. Yeah. In the in the airborne battle group. We had eight always. It seem adequate. It's not adequate. Two. Two. A warrant on a warrant officer and a sergeant. Right. So these two. children are kind of climbing through it. Yeah. So they're, they're able they, to manage despite all of this. They're coming through the fences. And and of course, what what Canadian soldier is going to shoot a child? Mm -hmm. Okay, you stole something. Anyway. But it just was getting out of control. And we bring in the elders uh -huh. and sit them down. And there, there is no police force you can go to. Uh -huh. There is no judges. There is, like, they have a clan structure, so they have their internal elders. Okay. But 
if they don't want to play, mm -hmm. then you put the kids in the truck, take mm -hmm. them downtown, mm -hmm. and minutes later, they're right back. I see. So and even, even the parents, like that's not no. really an option. If their parents are even still alive. Right. And that didn't seem to be something we, a button we could press because mm -hmm. nobody knew who they were. Right. Anyway, and it was just getting worse and worse. As tensions begin to rise, thievery becomes increased. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you talk to the locals through the translators and everybody. And, you know, it's just like sand. It just grates after a while, no mm -hmm. matter how much you think I can get through it. Right. And they'd say, look, if you Canadians want this stuff so well protected, then protect it better. Right. These are just kids. Mm -hmm. If you can't save yourself from kids, why, what are you doing here? Right. And then, of course, what are we supposed to do? Just shoot them? Mm -hmm. And the locals would say, well, that's what you have to do, inshallah. Mm -hmm. Inshallah, right. Well, and inshallah is a very complex term, too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just... Anyway, so anxiety and tensions are rising on both sides. Mm -hmm. The locals have said, build bigger fences, put more guards on it, nothing we can do. Anyway, they, um, we took a bunch of prisoners, these kids, and... The interpreters came out. I don't remember how this happened. And it was, the elders had, had said, you guys just got to be harsher with them. Mm -hmm. And children like this, I don't know if it's the exact ones, had been taken into the village before and within hours or right back and away it goes again. Mm -hmm. So the interpreters said, look, here, put these signs on them. And they'd probably say, I'm a thief. Mm -hmm. I'm a thief. Yeah. So some shame, tie him up. Different languages? I, I think it was in Somali and English. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's, the resolution wasn't great on the photo provided, but... So yeah. they got signs on them. I'm a thief, I'm a thief. So the, sure. the, the, the Somali interpreters are trying to mm -hmm. intimidate them. Now, coming out from the village were a group of elders. It wasn't a long walk, but they, they came out. They'd heard this was going on. And I'm there. And... Uh, I see the one of the local imams mm -hmm. and everything takes time through a translator. So somebody has to speak, the translator has to figure out what idioms and phrases are trying to say, give it in English or give it in Somali and goes back and forth. So they hand me a machete that was a piece of old spring seal. Mm -hmm. And of course the, the children are hearing it in their language yeah. real time. Right. And it's basically like you're the local religious leader. Mm -hmm. Just cut their hands off. Wow. Saves us doing it. Yeah. You do it. And then you'll yeah. be seen to be really strong. Yeah. And just, just cut their hands off. Right. So I'm holding this. The kids have heard it right away. Yeah. You know, and then the translator has to say, you know, sure. well, they want you to cut their hands off. This yeah. is what they're saying. Blah, 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 blah. Hand the, hand the thing back. No. Yeah. We, we don't do this. So it wasn't just the threat of them hearing it. He had actually intended... For me to do it. For you to do it. Right. Physically. Here, here it hands, is. Hands off these children. Yeah. You do it because we're just tired of doing this sort of stuff for you. Sure. Like, finally, you guys got to yeah. be strong. Right. Be forceful. Sure. Set an example. Yeah. We don't do that. It's extreme. In our view. Again, this is not what we do in Petawawa. Yeah. Right. But. So, I said, you know, these people are bad people. They're thieves. They're mm -hmm. bad people. Mm hmm you know, look what they've done. Mm -hmm. Eventually, a group of kids. So someone. So that's what's happened. The, the kids are really upset. They're all crying. Behind the photographer is a group of locals right. who are there waiting for us to do something. Mm -hmm. We let them go and the locals took them into town okay. with them. What happened to them? I don't know. I, I do know that about two days later, similar group. They were put in the trucks right away, went downtown, and the locals stoned them to death. Wow. As if to say, are you got happy now, Canadians? Wow. So that's that's a lot. Sorry, that's uh, quite a reaction. But this is so far at this point, so far out of our scope of duties. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, anything we do with civilians, if you take them prisoner right. for some infraction, you have to give them to civilian police. So at the same time, this United Task Force, mm -hmm. not the UN, was trying to recreate a Somali police force. I see. And we had some, but then we found out painfully that they weren't from the right clan. Okay. 
and then they were using the police to actually get their own things done. Right. There's some corruption. Some. Yeah. Anyway, so that's the picture. Um, it, Thank you for that. It came up during the inquiry and was handled, I think, pretty well. And I had the, I got the CDS's commendation for the action. So, Excellent. I mean, one picture, right? Yeah. Anyway. Well, thank you for the context. I think that adds a lot of value. So UNITAF was unable to end the civil war, obviously. In some ways, it's still ongoing, oh, as I understand. Absolutely. It. Yeah. It still carries on. Or when the cooperation of local warlords. Were these goals secondary to the humanitarian efforts, do you think? I think they probably ran parallel mm -hmm. that, you know, it's will create an atmosphere of peace, like mm -hmm. make room for peace to establish itself. Sure. And then other people above us, we're mm -hmm. not there to build governments. Mm -hmm. It's Canadian Airborne Regiment. Right. You know, you send them to a place where you want to grab something really important yeah. or smash things. Yeah. Like a rapid intervention team, not necessarily to end a civil war. No. So we talked a bit about impressions. So having signed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, do you think that Canada, Canada embodied the spirit of the declaration, you know, the promotion or defense of universal human rights during the mission? You know, I think that all the declarations and statements and conventions are important in that they lay out for us goals and objectives that our humanity strives for. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a little bit like sausages as well. Mm -hmm. People find sausages really tasty. Mm -hmm. They don't want to stand around and look at how they're made. Right. So, I, so there was not a lot of discussion on universal rights and, and I, that doesn't mean that the soldiers weren't very, very aware of it. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you a good example of a moral dilemma sure. that actually came up as, as part of the, the, the Red Cross. Uh, the, the, the UN wasn't there with us. Their mission only was in the city of Mogadishu, never got out. Mm -hmm. So a number of young women around the age of puberty were, were dying of sepsis, I think it was. Okay. Horrible infections. And the medics... You know, we had little clinics. So we did set up clinics and we did try to do those things. Sure. But it, they didn't always work out the way we thought they would. Mm -hmm. Best intentions. Yeah. But it didn't always work out in practice. Right. So you treat the women and children and the men would come along and beat up the women that were in line. How do you police that? What do you do? Yeah. You, you try to get the men away. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as soon as your vehicles all leave, mm -hmm. what's going to happen? They'll be right back. The, the only worse. Yeah. Anyway, so these girls were dying of these horrible infections because they were being circumcised using either shards of glass or um, the old pop tops okay. of a can. Okay. You know, it was kind of like a beaver tail shape. Yeah. And uh, very sharp. Very sharp. So they would use that for, or, for mutilation. For for yeah, female That's horrifying. circumcision. Absolutely horrifying. Absolutely horrifying. So the medics, once we once our medics would find out what had happened, usually by that it's too late. You can't mm -hmm. do anything. You know, or it would take such intervention you need a you know a hospital that we didn't have. Mm -hmm. So they put together kits with you know a surgical blade mm -hmm. and now. I know people right now are probably saying, oh my God, you cooperated with it. There was no way we could try to do anything to get them to stop. They weren't going to, we, we, we tried everything. We'll give you extra grain. We'll give you extra food. We'll do this. We'll do that. Do it anyway. Well, so the medics put these little kits together. At least the person won't die. Uh -huh. Well, foreign affairs found out and it was stopped immediately because a person has a right to their whole body. Right. You can't make it easy for them to do this. You're trying to mitigate, though, an otherwise horrifying situation where 
doing this procedure is barbaric, but here are the tools that you, at least you won't like. They won't die. They won't. Yeah, they won't be murdered in the process. Right. Because when you're dead, there are no more options for you. Right. But I, I even today, you know those those questions you don't ask a kid with a grade. Grade 11 Cape Breton education is not supposed to be answering those questions. Yeah. A medic who's been told to do the right thing, mm -hmm. preserve life, help mm -hmm. all of us. Mm -hmm. While the politicians and other folks go, oh, you shouldn't have done that thing. You should have done another thing. And, well, you're not here. I wish you were here. Well, you know, we, we've served in Petawawa. And again, I think our greatest, I don't want to use the word failure. Our greatest challenge was that this was not, one, it wasn't Cyprus. We've been so trained in Cyprus. Mm -hmm. This isn't peacekeeping here, mm -hmm. you know. Oh yeah, yeah. So we got it a bit tough, you know. I hear you have a leave center in Mombasa though, mm -hmm. in Nairobi, mm -hmm. and and so on the ground you're trying to trying to do these things. Mm -hmm. Another example: we, I'm out at one of our forward bases. They didn't call them forward base in those days. Anyway, I'm looking at the binoculars, and I see coming along um, nomads, Bedouin, mm -hmm. certain folks. And there's women out front and they have a yoke uh, on and uh, two of those yellow plastic old oil, like cooking oil mm -hmm. containers, okay. one in each one, full of water probably. Right. So there's two or three of those and then donkeys and then children and then the big camels and the men at the back. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking the translator, I said, why, why they got that? Why that order? Why not put the camels out front? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, 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 no. Landmines. Pardon? Yeah, we have to weigh down the women so that they weigh enough to activate the landmines because the camels are just too expensive. Like you can't lose a camel. Oh my God. So the answer to the landmine question, weigh the women down and have them walk out front. They value the lives of the camels more than the Far lives. Far better than the, their women. The women. Yep. What do you do? I have two degrees in theology. Yeah. You know, what do you say? That's wrong. Yeah, okay, so what? Mm -hmm. What what are you going to do? Are you going to get your vehicles out there? We don't have mine clearing equipment. We have sure. some. Very, very, very basic. Sure. We're going to clear the mines in Somalia so that the women don't get treated that way. Mm -hmm. Then they may find some other way. Mm -hmm. And please, I I'm I'm probably sounding like a colonial post colonial white Anglo Saxon male passing judgment on some other culture. But I, I come from this culture, mm -hmm. and so I take my values and I see things that are different, mm -hmm. and it causes a lot of dissonance. And then for some of the soldiers, it makes them really angry. Mm -hmm. Why are we here, Padre? Mm -hmm. If if they like if they're doing these things, what right. what are we doing here? Yeah, they see this depravity. Well, I don't know if they've used the word depravity. They they just see it as really, really broken. And mm -hmm. why are we risking our lives here? Yeah. We're not going to fix it in our we're short not. time here. Nope. Yeah. Oh, no. Remember, we were at that time, we've been in Cyprus for almost 40 years. Mm -hmm. We were going to be in Somalia once. Mm -hmm. There was no stomach to bring anybody in after us. Yeah. From a Canadian perspective, was the mission successful? So I'll go back to something I said earlier in that we didn't define what we didn't give a definition to success what does success look like mm -hmm. i think in that if we gave spaces you know i think sometimes at peace peace never grows unless it's planted in justice mm -hmm. we know that um, you can stop people fighting but until you deal with matters of justice it never goes anywhere mm -hmm. like northern ireland you, you know, you can just keep putting in greater and greater military force and just uh -huh. stop people from doing these things, uh -huh. mostly. But when you start to address why they want to fight, what uh -huh. are the injustices that they're working against uh -huh. or living with? What's their narrative? Uh -huh. And begin to unwind some of that. Uh -huh. You like cracks in the concrete. Uh -huh. You give room for things to grow. Uh -huh. And it's slow and it's painful and you can't pull it along. Uh -huh. And you have to trust and there's broken trust and all these things. The narratives are still there. Sure. So I like to think that in the absence of a definition of success, 
we could say we delivered so many tons of food or oil or or did these things within days of leaving uh, within a day of leaving our camp it was it was torn down and went back into the desert mm -hmm. again looted completely gone now maybe maybe there was a person born or someone that was allowed to make a different decision that did something they wouldn't have done if we weren't there mm -hmm. maybe more, more of a like a butterfly effect sort yeah of thing. yeah and that's not what we like. We like to see, you know, we're leaving and there's a democratic right. government and there's a police force and there's judges. And right. And there's a direct cause and effect as opposed yeah. to indirect ones that hopefully things will improve just based on us being here. And maybe, maybe it made space for some people to at least see something different, mm -hmm. at least experience something different. You know, I, 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 I don't know. I, I, I don't doubt that later when this united task force folded down the united nations came in and they were less successful than we were right and eventually they left do you think the humanitarian aid that was offered do you think that was lasting well no because you're filling a person's stomach right it's so it lasts until they're hungry again but they don't die right perhaps at least during that time that during that time they survive some right some don't um, and I don't, I, I don't know. I like to believe that that much effort, I mean, when a nation invests, it's the lives of its young people mm -hmm. and its treasure mm -hmm. to go to these places, to wear the Canadian flag, you, you know, you kind of want to get something for it, mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. And, and you like to believe that they're serving for the right reason. Sure. And that they're good men and women and they are. We have a we have a, a, a growing and, and really diverse Somali community in Canada. Maybe maybe that I don't know is part of that a, a result of the, the 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 work we did in Somalia. I don't know, but if since there was no definition of success, right? Um, the ordering council that sent us was only done in we left in early December. I think I, I'll, I'll go back and research again. The order and council that created the task force and sent it uh -huh. was passed in June, along with the rules of engagement. Right. Like it was all the things we should have done uh -huh. that a professional army does, uh -huh. the checks and balances with parliament uh -huh. and with the army uh -huh. didn't happen. Until after the fact, essentially. Yeah. And, and then of course there's an election Yeah. and the, the, we had soldiers kill a prisoner. Right. Two soldiers mm -hmm. beat to death a prisoner. Mm -hmm. Took hours to do it. Yeah. They took pictures. The pictures were sent back to Canada to be developed. This is before cell phones and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. The pictures are discovered. Like a roll of film they sent back. Yeah. And of course there was a body. So even before the pictures yeah. came back, mm -hmm. there was a body. Mm -hmm. And then the army does what it does. You know, they're arrested. But we only have two MPs. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to have eight. Mm -hmm. So what do we do with prisoners? Well, what can you do? Well, they, they're put in a, a mortar pit. Mm -hmm. uh, it had a roof put on it and it's open on four, uh, all sides mm -hmm. and the roof could be taken off. And anyway, it's only one entrance in. So that was turned into a, a, a really hasty place to put right. Canadian prisoners. Right. And because you're in operations, um, there's only so much equipment you can take away. Uh, if you watch the movie Breaker Moran, mm -hmm. You know, when the prison that they're in is attacked, what right. is the first thing they hand the prisoners? Keys. And rifles. And rifles, yeah. You have to be able to protect you yourself. get out and join us. And... Yeah, we need you. Yeah. So the the prisoner, uh, Machi, had all his webbing, mm -hmm. no bayonet, no rifle, no weapon, like no magazine, no rounds. But he had a respirator, he had his boots, had his mm -hmm. webbing, had his helmet. Yeah, right. He has, to be able, he has to be able to protect himself. He has to be operationally ready. Yeah. With his PPE, et cetera. Right, because he hadn't, we weren't back in Canada. Mm -hmm. He hadn't yeah. gone through that process yet. Yeah, and operational needs supersede. Well, yeah, it, it, in that, but it had been so long since we've done this. I mean, we have rehearsed it, mm -hmm. but again, in Canada, you right. rehearse it, you know. And he, so the medical officer, I think, went to see him, and then they asked me to go down and see him. So we both signed the book like we would in Canada, going into the cells. Mm -hmm. 
And then hours later, he tried to hang himself. Right. In that same pit where he found, right, with his yeah. shoelaces, as I understand. Well, yeah, because he's got his boots. Right. Yeah. And they have to be laced up. Yeah. So it's not like, why didn't he have his boot? Do you should have taken them away? Well, no. You, again, the disconnect between an, uh, an operational mm -hmm. and would we have done it differently? Sure. Everyone would do something different if there's a negative outcome. Yeah. So the, the, the young kid, Sinead Aron, was beaten to death. Should not, no person dies that way. Should not. It's not what we do. Mm -hmm. No soldier does that. It was an awful thing. Mm -hmm. It was an aberration. You know, um, so they were arrested. They were tried. Uh, Matchy wasn't. Kyle Brown was. He went to the service detention barracks. Um, paid his debt to society. And that became the event mm -hmm. for the mission. Right. But it, it, it wasn't. There were, again, I suppose one day people will sit down and say, you know, here's, here, and if, if we knew, if we could capture the statistics, here's the rate of violence before we arrived, mm -hmm. local murders, mm -hmm. you know, and here's what happened when the Canadians right. were here. Right. They just about stopped. Mm -hmm. People were free to walk up and down the roads. Yeah. Vehicle traffic commenced right. again. So, in those, that, those don't capture headlines, though, per se. No. Things return to normal. Mm -hmm. So, that's what you're sent there to do. Mm -hmm. But when you leave, you know. So, I think the tangible, the photographable, the dynamic, it, it grabs. Mm -hmm. We know that. The non-tangible things, intangible, they're, they're much, of course, they're much harder to to say, let's let's look at these. Well, right. they're boring. Right, they're boring. You may not be able to quantify them. Right. Prove it. Right. I I can't. Mm -hmm. No. And the fact that the country is still still there. Right. What about regular Canadians who think about Somalia? They might read about Somalia and students, high school students. Like, what, what's the takeaway here? I I think the takeaway with two things. One, everything is not as you read and are told. So that's the first thing. And two, that the, the men and women who made those decisions and did those things in that faraway place were only a few years older than they would be right now. That's good perspective. And, and what would you do? Mm -hmm. What would you do in, in the, uh, the, the female circumcision? What would you do when you bring, you know, you work hard and risk your life to bring someone on a stretcher only to see the person dumped into the sand and the stretcher we use for something else. What would you do? What would you do? And do you know your Canadian values enough that you could hold on to them and, and that would be your lifeboat? Mm -hmm. Because you cannot become aggressive towards somebody else's stand. Mm -hmm. You need, like, that was one thing we always talked about. What do we believe as Canadians? How do we... Like, we can't leave here not being faithful to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that means being very selective sometimes in what we do. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that for the average high school student to say, you know what? It, they did some good things. And I think that's a bit of a hard sell sometimes. Not that we didn't do good things. But for the average young person, I would think they look at it and go, well, what, what, what did it look like? Mm -hmm. Can you prove it? Mm -hmm. And that, those things are hard to prove. Sure. But we were there. We tried. We invested ourselves. Canada took the best it had and put it in a very difficult place. You know, and I think that what neighbor wouldn't do that for another neighbor? Mm -hmm. You know, ministers of national defense mm -hmm. cycle through quickly. The sure. regiment is disbanded. Yeah. Do you and think that was warranted? That's a political decision. Yeah. And Politicians have the right to make political decisions. Fair. Did it solve the problem? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, what, what has changed? Mm -hmm. You know, like no one ever looked at our, our whole training system and say, is it, is it rigorous enough? Mm -hmm. You know, do we, uh, 10 years in Afghanistan, you know, and we're still trying to figure out how to do the basic style. So I, I think that anything that the gift of Somalia to the army would have been, I think, that moment to ask the big questions. Mm -hmm. 
like just because these men and women are qualified at these levels, mm -hmm. are they also qualified to do those things? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know the other step that should have been in there, but mm -hmm. clearly something did not go well. Right. And I don't think we ever got to answer that. Mm -hmm. All the dancers in this great dance played the role they were supposed to play. Right. I was just surprised how unprepared we were to play it. Mm -hmm. It's well said. Any final thoughts? It's been, a, I don't know, I'm tired. It's been a long time since I've talked about this stuff. And you know, the people that are going to be watching this are going to sit there and go, well, who's the old guy? And what did he do? And, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, I have, you know, we're out in, in, in June and had with these guys I served with in Somalia. There wasn't a conversation we didn't have, like, what would we have done different, Padre? Did we fail, Padre? You know, what a terrible summary of a man's career when he looks back and thinks the greatest amount of effort I gave was all for naught. And that these men carry it. They've all had great careers, done amazing things with their life. But somehow this thing, the stain that they believe is there, follows them. And... They're looking for some personal contribution they could have made, something they could have done differently. You know, and it just brings tears and frustration. Now, the nation's not going to take that away. That will go and we're all dead. That, that's just a fact. It has nothing to do with that. There's going to be no happy back from Somalia Day, big parade. That's not going to happen. But I, I would hope that the men and women that were there will all in their own way find peace. Not satisfaction, but peace, which is based in justice. I'll go right back to the beginning again. Mm -hmm. And I think the greatest justice you could find is that at the time, did you do the best you could have done with what you knew? And if you did, and you can answer it that way, not would I have done it differently, mm -hmm. but at that time, in that space, then that's really the best you're going to get. Mm 